abnormal psychology students here we go with chapter 10 substance related and other addictive disorders I'm gonna be upfront and honest I think honesty is usually the best policy unless your friend asks you uh, do you think I look fat sometimes you got to curb the truth depending on the person's emotional state but uh, I've already had some drugs this morning and um, I may get in trouble from saying it but uh, I had a cup of tea and I'm drinking some more caffeine so caffeine is the most widely abused psychoactive substance in the world so a lot of you are caffeine raise your hands if you're a caffeine addict tell the truth you know that Starbucks already knows what name to put on your cup before you even walk in hmm? I love some of these excuses uh, a truck back through the windshield into my wife's face right um, to avoid hitting the bumper of the car in front I hit the pedestrian oh that makes a lot of sense right people are always challenged by wanting to alter their universe right maybe they're not happy with the way things are going and so they want to see something different and so we use substances and that's primarily the reason they alter our sense of being our state of mind they keep us awake they put us asleep they get us to see things that we don't normally see <clears throat> substance abuse had been with us since the beginning of time uh, we use a lot of substances and if they make us feel good and that's the main reason we take them because they make us feel good or they make us feel different uh, then we continue to use them I mean if they do nothing to us we'll stop using them and so <coughs> excuse me um, as we build tolerance we don't use as much uh, we actually need more of the substance that is and so we have to consume more of it as we started uh, with our chemistry classes started experimenting with all kinds of substances and I can imagine the first individuals figuring out that alcohol would make you feel really really strange uh, we started to alter the chemistry leading to some becoming addicted to substances and some substances are definitely addictive uh, if you don't believe me for example as I mentioned earlier caffeine if you are used to caffeine as part of, part of your daily regimen, try not consuming any caffeine for a long period of time and watch your body react, right? You might start getting headaches, you might start getting jittery, you might uh, be tired all the time, you might even, your mood might alter, right? I'm not saying that you're a, an addict, but I'm saying that we do get used to substances and our bodies crave or more. Sometimes substance abuse occurs quite um, by accident. We get prescribed certain medication, for example, some pain pills, and it takes away the pain, which is exactly what we want it to do. And then we kind of like that feeling, right? And there's a lot of legal substances we can go out there and purchase. And of course, there are illegal substances. Society has always struggled with this notion. You know, should we make things uh, ban all kinds of drugs right and we struggle with the irony of doing this because you know we we used to say for decades you know marijuana is bad right alcohol is good and we've seen the ramifications of uh, the destruction of our society with alcohol at one point even prohibiting its use in the United States with prohibition and then um, changing that uh, article so to speak now we see alcohol embraced in our sporting events and commercials and and so forth and now we're starting to change our attitude about substances like marijuana and so some people say well just let people decide right people should have enough common sense to make their own wise decision it's their body except for the problem with substances is it doesn't just affect that person it affects a lot of people the main reason that 
prohibition occurred was because of women who were tired of having their husbands uh, go and cash their hard-earned check after work, spend it all at the bar, and then come home and get beaten up by these same men and abusing their children primarily because they had more, no more money to buy alcohol. So speaking of alcohol, we're talking about depressants, right? It depresses the central nervous system. Now, some people think, well, you know, it makes me a better dancer. I can sing better. I just need it to relax. And again, uh, take dance classes, take singing classes, uh, meditate. There are other alternatives besides needing to consume a substance to change your behavior, right? Um, Binge drinking in particular, I remember encountering a number of individuals who never heard that term before. And um, they, they said, well, I, I just simply have a couple of beers on the weekend. And I don't drink during the week to go to, you know, when I'm going to school or going to work. I just have a couple on the weekend. And that sounds pretty reasonable. But if you're um, a clinician, a good follow-up question is to ask, what do you mean by a couple? And they say a couple cases and don't even blink an eye. Well, that, that's a binge, right? That's definitely a binge. <clears throat> We've learned through history that alcohol can poison the system, especially if you have too much too quickly and you can die from alcohol poisoning. We have every year people, young people dying from consuming mass quantities uh, maybe as a dare, maybe as an initiation to get into a particular club or organization, fraternity, sorority, for example. It can lead to the detriment of you mentally, right? It can also lead to you losing all your family and friends, but maybe even have an impact on potential offspring, especially if it's a mother who's abusing the substances. So, you know, these are not necessarily, um, I, I don't want to give the illusion that uh, alcohol is all evil, right? Some people can use it responsibly, never have an issue. But we see a pattern that we think of as the addictive personality, a pattern that goes through families that seem to have issues with substances, right? And if not substances, then other form of addictive behaviors like gambling, for example. So look at your family history. Do you have alcoholics in your family? This is not a guarantee like, well, my whole family is all a bunch of alcoholics, that you're going to become an alcoholic too. And it's no reason for you to say, well, I'm an alcoholic because everybody else before me was alcoholic and that's why they made me into alcoholic. That's just kind of a cop-out. It just says that, like most things, we have the genetic propensity to become an alcohol and uh, alcoholic, just like we have the genetic propensity to become uh, diabetic or have high blood pressure, we have to be cognizant of this and be careful of this. So let me talk about my case study for the day, and it's called Crazy Indian Women. It takes place in Lansing, Michigan, when I worked in an agency called Cristo Rey. Now, if you recall Cristo Rey, if you translate that uh, name, translates to Christ the King, but again, it wasn't a religious institution. It was an outpatient um, human services organization. It involves two women who are Native American. The first woman I met was mom, and uh, she worked in the substance abuse unit of the counseling center that I was in charge of. And when I recommended that they Put together the mental health and substance abuse units together instead of having them as separate entities because we were treating some of the same individuals i got a chance to go and introduce myself to all the substance abuse counselors and find out what their input was in this union of the two programs the first thing i noticed about the mom therapist was um, she was very knowledgeable about substances As a matter of fact she taught me a lot about uh Alcoholics Anonymous. She was a sponsor. She was a sponsor to help many people keep from consuming alcohol. She spent 20 years of her life as an alcoholic herself. 
Uh, she was the kind of woman in the community that you would always see intoxicated. She was married and divorced. She had one daughter, and that daughter turned out to be what's, what we call as a latchkey kid. It's the kind of kid that has to kind of raise themselves. They have to keep their key, uh, the house key around their neck because, you know, mom wasn't around to make them breakfast, lunch, and dinner to sign forms for school or anything like that to help them with the homework. Her daughter had to kind of do that on herself. Matter of fact, some days the daughter didn't see mom home at all. So she'd go searching for her, going to her bars that she would mo normally frequent. Sometimes she'd find her outside the bar, uh, passed out uh, through alcohol consumption. Sometimes she couldn't find her mother immediately, but always managed to find her eventually, right? So fortunately, this therapist had uh, got her act together after several relapses, and she had a good another 20 years of sobriety under her belt. So she was helping others, and she got involved in the substance abuse profession. What better person who's been there to help others, right? Another thing that stood out about this therapist is in her office, which was a standard therapeutic office, there was a stockpile of Pepsis in back of her. And I thought, oh, Cristo Rey, is, it's a nonprofit agency. They're always doing fundraisers. So, you know, maybe this is something that they didn't have storage for. So she's storing it uh, for an upcoming fiesta or some kind of fundraising event. But while we're talking about the program, she reaches over and she opens up one of her bottles and she starts to consume it. And I thought, okay. The conversation continues. She finishes with that one. She reaches over another and starts drinking that. <clears throat> and so I finally asked her, I said, is that for like some kind of upcoming event? And she says, no, this is my own personal stash. I'm talking about cases of this Pepsi. It turns out that she transferred her addiction from alcohol to Pepsi. So she had her drug of choice right by her. Now, obviously, Pepsi was not going to get her thrown in jail or uh, cause a whole lot of work problems, right? While getting to know this therapist, she asked a favor. She says, can you talk to my daughter? She works in a different program at Cristo Rey, but uh, she recently went up, uh, had like a bad breakup. And I was wondering if you could talk to her, maybe offer her some guidance. And I initially thought, oh, ooh, gosh, it's going to be kind of odd for me, for her to be one of my clients. She says, no, no, I don't mean like a formal therapeutic relationship. I mean, just kind of informally, just to see how she's doing. I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So I, you know, I kind of made my way downstairs at some point, and I didn't come up to her and say, hey, your mom told me you're all messed up from a breakup, and I should talk to you, and you need help. No, I just, very casual, we're talking about this, that, and the other. And uh, the daughter told me that she recently suspected that her boyfriend at the time was cheating on her. And what she did was one night she went to his home and destroyed all his windows in his vehicle. She took a baseball bat and smashed them all the smithereens. <clears throat> and when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's a pretty strong reaction. And they broke up, and later she found out that he had not cheated on her, but the damage was sort of done, as you can imagine. And I asked her, do you think your reaction to your suspicion of the boyfriend cheating on you has anything to do with your mother? It was a definitely what the fuck moment, and I'll tell you her response next video.